Okay, here we go. Hello folks, how are you? I hope you're out there. It seems like every time I do this, we have some sort of technical problem. Now, I know it's probably me. I'm probably a complete idiot. I am a novice with this live stream stuff, but anyway, here we are. Um, so Clayton Jacobson, uh, a man of many, many talents. Um, you look at his IMDB page and he's a director, an actor, a writer, an editor. Um, you know, he's the consummate filmmaker. And uh, so a, a man uh, after my own heart. This is the sort of filmmaker that I really appreciate. Um, uh, so without further ado, I'm going to see if he's out there in the in the Internet land and put him on. There he is in his in his <laughs> in his spaceship. Hey, Clayton, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I'm very good, thanks, mate. So, um, so yeah, look, thanks for doing this. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of these things, and I think for me, the the thing that I'm particularly interested to talk to you about is um, well, everything about what you do, because I think you're approaching this thing in a, in absolutely the best possible way. Um, but you've you're building your own studio, basically, or you've built your own studio that you have complete autonomy over which i'd love to hear a bit more about well it was um very much i've been very interested in what you've been doing of late too for the very same reasons but um i, I guess my um i moved about 40 minutes 50 minutes north of melbourne about 10 years ago and um we're on six acres and they had a four car garage and i'm not much of a car person so i thought well what can i do with this garage that might appease myself and the accountants and um so I thought I'll, I'll, I'll turn it into a film studio. And I'm greatly sort of um, inspired by the work ethic of Robbie Rodriguez, his whole approach to um, finding a balance between family and, and filmmaking. Um, it has always been a very big thing for me because um, for, for, for the, the many years that I've been making film ever since I was like 10, um, anyone I've ever known that's ever been doing this well and properly and professionally and with some success has usually had to sacrifice family somewhere along the, along the way. I've known so many filmmakers that have lost partners and, and don't have great connections with their kids. And I just that was something I never wanted to have happen. And um, uh, the, the short version of this is that when Ken, when I made Kenny and because we didn't have a big crew and basically the whole you know, making the film was one thing, but getting the film to an audience was an entirely different animal. And there was only really a handful of us. It was about four of us that were running the whole marketing campaign. And as a result, I was on it. Um, I was, I think I averaged five hours sleep uh, a day for a year and a half. And um, it, it damn near nearly destroyed my marriage. And, um, and, and I remember my son, who's in the film, played the young boy in Kenny was um, got to a point where he he actually insisted that I not mention the film in the house because it, <laughs> it, it, it got it so so anyway when we uh, moved out here I thought there has to be a way of um, finding a better balance and also the simple fact that I'm not any I'm not getting younger and um, just looking ahead to the future and for some time now a lot of my friends and colleagues and, and crew that I work with are all sort of being uh, a lot of them are, are sort of uh, retiring and they don't have young children around anymore and they've got all this time up their sleeve and they often will tell me that they're retiring um, against their better judgment they they they're moving aside for the younger generation and uh and so i thought gee maybe there's a way of um making films on a smaller budget with smaller crews i've always looked for that I've, it, it, i think it all stems back from just those early days of making super eight films in my garage and that sort of and going to swinburne that sort of can do with as little bit of money and as small a group of people as you can has never left me. So this is really an extension of that. And this spaceship is, <laughs> is, uh, is another example of that. It's, uh, it's a simple uh, reality where I've been trying to pitch a sci-fi film and I'm not known for science fiction. And as you well know, uh, the studios in Hollywood uh, are very particular about pigeonholing people. And so I've got this science fiction script that I've been trying to get up and I've got very close a couple of times, but it always comes back to that same question. Well, we know you can do comedy, but can you do sci-fi? And uh, 
I actually, I, I remember saying in one meeting with me, it's the, um, with me, it's the other way around. It's you can do sci-fi, but can you do comedy? <laughs> yeah, can you no, do I comedy? think I've, I think I've proven a couple of times that I can't. So, oh, so that's not yeah. true. <laughs> that's not true. But, it's, uh, but you know, it's, it's funny how it, it's just that. Look, I understand it. We all pigeonhole. We, we're guilty of it ourselves as as directors and, and producers. But uh, but I um, so this is an attempt to create a uh, a little pitch video. Um, done on the smell of an oily rag. I was in the middle of casting my next film when this madness happened with COVID. And, uh, and I thought, well, what do I do now? I'm stuck at home. I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll make a spaceship. And uh, it's taken me a few months on my own, up here about three hours a day. And it's all made from found items. Um, it's actually a post-production. It's like a museum to everything we were using back in the 80s, Alex. It's like, yeah, you know, I, no, I notice a, you, there's like a umatic in there somewhere, right? Yeah. Like I, no, I notice a little, uh, the thing that I'm, the little knob that I'm very familiar with that yeah. winds of the tape backwards and forwards. So, so I've, got a, I've got an SP beta cam here. I've got a umatic machine. I've got time code, time code generators. These are all the, the artifacts left behind from a post-production facility that closed shop and said, look, I've got all this gear. I'm going to throw it all out. Do you want it? I said, absolutely. I'm sitting, um, it's a little bit like when we went and saw Star Wars for the first time and, and any of us that have been making a, 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 anything <laughs> said, oh my God, they just blew up the world, Tatooine with a with a Grass Valley um, vision yeah. mixer. Do you remember that? <laughs> That's exactly right. And you were saying it's the, uh, this, the alien aesthetic too, which it very much is, and um, the original alien aesthetic. And, and uh and that was the same thing, you know. All this, all the technology that was all crammed into that, the Nostromo mm. was um, was kind of uh, was uh, was interesting, you know. It was all it was all um, that kind of stuff, you know. Um, but um, no, look, everything you just said is uh, is music to my ears. I mean, we're roughly the same age. We're actually almost mm. exactly the same age, which is kind of scary. Um, almost born in the same month and year, and. Um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the film industry is extremely destructive to uh, family life. It asks you, it, 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 it insists that you work ridiculously long hours. Um, and, you know, that's, that's fine when you're a young, exploitable pup and you sort of want to be exploited. But when you get to a certain age and you actually value your time with your family and just, just even just time to sleep you know, and yes. re- re- recuperate from the week that you've just been through on a, on a shoot. I think it's um, it's it's not very uh, conducive to that kind of behaviour. So I too am going through exactly the same process as you in that I I miss the days when I was very hands on and there was small crews. You know, I miss my film school days. I had the best yeah. fun and my first feature, which was which was like ten people on the crew and I'm pushing the dolly and saying action. You know, all all at once. Yes. You know, I, I miss that that hands-on uh, situation, and you know, you just don't have that sort of fun when you, when you're sitting there totally stressed out uh, mm. on a day that's costing you know five hundred thousand dollars, and there's three hundred people running around, and every minute, everything, every little thing that goes wrong costs you time, and you're falling behind. It's just the the most unpleasant way to be so-called creative you know yes so and there's so, so much risk management involved as well isn't there i mean it's it's that thing of you know everything has to be cross-checked and you know you've got completion guarantee everyone has to have a reason and an answer and a question for right. moving forward yeah. and and the thing that i loved about exactly those times when we were kids is um uh is just that simple thing of going from an idea to a completion felt pure it it it, it, it felt like it was there was it wasn't encumbered by your parents saying should you really be making this little animation you know in your bedroom yeah they were they they didn't know what the hell you were doing but they were usually very encouraging or they were in my case yeah and um and you know it was so and, and so much so that when you needed to light up a scene they'd gladly drive their cars up into the garage and turn the high beams on so you could <laughs> absolutely light up. yeah my dad but actually my dad actually handcrafted a film light for me because I think partly because he didn't want to spend any money on a real film light, so he actually he actually made one from bits he got it got got at the hardware store. I think it was Knockin' Kirby's or something, which you, you probably didn't have in Melbourne, but it was a famous big hardware no, no, store no. in in Sydney, and um, and so he made this thing himself. But I mean, it's like that's the sort of stuff that just that's dedication, parent parental dedication beyond anything anyone would understand in today's today's First. world, you know window i ever jumped through as a stunt when you were doing your own stunts as a kid was a 
a toffee window made by the lady up the road who was really good at making <laughs> toffee apples. And I asked, would you think you'd be able to make me a, a square sheet of toffee? And uh, she said, yeah, I think I could do that. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's the fun of it, of course. It's, and, and it's yeah. like, you know, and, and trying to get back to that sort of that magic. Because, I mean, you know, we're, we're still kids, you know, we're, we're, we're older, older kids, mature kids, mm. but... But making films is is this sort of fantasy world that we would like to inhabit. And I mean, every filmmaker, every storyteller in film is a is a, is just a big kid. I think you know, imagining mm. the, these worlds, and particularly when you're in the world of science fiction. But in but in any in any genre, you know, and so it's 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 wonderful to be able to tap back into that to facilitate that sense of imagination and play and play. You know, and mm. I tell you, you just can't do it. I mean. Sometimes you can on the really big movies, but most of the time you've got some pro- producer or studio guy breathing down your neck, or just the tyranny of the schedule and the budget, and and it's just re- it's really hard to sort of tap into that sort of inner child when you're yeah. under those circumstances. But look, tell me a little bit about. I'm, I mean, I I I'm, I I really like your your films. I love the stuff you you've been doing lately, and and there's one thing in particular that. I've seen, I think I saw it on, I think you posted something on Facebook, which was this thing with an orchestra in Melbourne that's quite yeah. formally constructed. I really, what is that? Is that going to be a yeah. longer piece or? Yeah, so that, that's um, that's the Melbourne Scar Orchestra who I've had an affiliation with for many years. I, yeah. I've, I've directed many of their music videos and the the head of the Melbourne Scar Orchestra is a, a firecracker of a guy uh, called Nicky Bomber and he, he's been in many bands and he, put this 30-piece orchestra together many years ago, and they tour all over the world. And they are the most amazing, fantastical bunch of misfits, but also extraordinary world-class musicians. Yes. And everything they do, they scarize, every, you know, that, that sort of, you know, uh, 60 scar, the upbeat scar, they do that to uh, songs that they've created themselves. They've got a lot of originals, but also everything from the Star Wars theme to you know, get smart, and there, there is nothing quite like seeing them live. Anyway, this uh, for years, uh, Nikki and I have talked about doing a film together, and because um, I, 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 he was impressed with the way we did Kenny, the way that I basically planted an actor with a real toilet company, and what you get is the value add of all of those locations and events that yes. they are naturally hinged to. Yeah. Well, it dawned on us that we had the same thing with him touring, that he was with this band, they were going to all these interesting locations and they've no, they trust me and have known me for years and he wanted me to document them just playing. And I said, why, why don't we make a film? Why don't we, if you can guarantee me two hours a day where I get access to everyone for two hours, um, I reckon we can do something special. And, and in between all of that, I'll grab different people at various points. So I basically ended up, um, we're doing this literally just as the COVID thing was happening. Um, we, I, I went on tour with him. It was just my partner and I, Vicky and I, went for two weeks. And, uh, and then I would build up these scenes with the locations they had. And we, we nutted out a very basic structure to the story, which is basically the, the MSO, when we first see them in this film, they're going to be a funeral band. And they're a very sort of dour, downbeat bunch of guys that don't say much. I'm borrowing very heavily from sort of you know films like leonard grad cowboys uh, you know do america right yeah the, the, the early work of jim jaramush you know down by law um but it's very fellini-esque know. too right it's very uh well, eight that, and a half it, it, something it is a, it's got elements of that but yeah. i would say more so my leaning the the guy that's in my head the whole time i'm making this is Jacques Tati. so right yes you know I, 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 we haven't had many people sort of emulate his no, style no. um other than some of jerry lewis's more obscure sort of work yeah you know, where he was but um but i uh, so that's the idea is is going on tour with them and uh, so it's a very simple idea about a, a, a funeral uh, band that end up somehow becoming this dynamic melbourne scar orchestra Fantastic. and all the trials and tribulations in between but it has this it's black and white and has this very very sort of almost silent yeah, film. Well, I, uh, I love it, and there's a lot of subtitles, a lot of pe- people speaking in different languages and subtitles, and yeah. and and it's it's it is quite it's quite wonderful in that respect. Um, but but um, is it so? Is it going to be? A, is it hopefully going to be a feature length film or, or absolutely? Uh, yeah, I'd, pending I'd like on pandemic. Is that is that what we're pending on? Well, yeah, ex- exactly. And yeah. it's um, as is my want. It's sort of interesting, you know, when Kenny became 
um, popular, I thought that that would give me good access to the, the window of filmmaking. But the truth of the matter is uh, I made Kenny and then spent the next 10 years trying to get my next film made and really struggled. Um, and part of that is that I hate repeating myself. Mm. If anyone looks at any of my work, my favourite thing is to dive into a culture, uh, into a, a genre that I'm not familiar with. My favourite thing as a filmmaker is to ask the question how, why, what, and and throw myself into it because I think that's when you make the best work rather than going into something where you seemingly have all the answers. I, I don't really like those kind of films. I like films where you know it, it's an exploration from start to finish. And as a res- and of course, as you as you know, with the funding bodies and what have you, often it's about repeating yourself. Mm. And um, and so I've had to develop different ways of getting films made and getting films seen. So like Brothers Nest, the last film we did, we actually you know got that off the ground by getting the cinemas, the regional cinemas, to fund. Yeah, they actually paid up front in advance on the movie hire, which I don't think anyone's ever done before. And in return, they got special treatment uh, from Shane and myself filming filming particular uh, video pieces that so, we would that they would play to their audience. So you raised your initial uh, funds doing that, just that, right? And then you went we, to the yeah. funding bodies from there, right? Yeah, Tate Brady um, and Jason Byrne and, and myself went up to the movie uh, the the um, the movie convention where they you know where all the uh, the distributors sort of basically show all the exhibitors the, what's on offer for the following year. Mm. And we went there and pitched this film to all the mums and dads sort of cinema owners. And, and in the space of a day, I think it was two days, we had raised 240000 But not only that, we had a release date and we had our cinemas intact. In so it made everything else. And then I had a, a brother who was willing to star in the film and he gave me a, 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 a date. And so... Instead of kind of going with, you know, hat in hand, I was going to all the funding bodies saying, look, we've got our release date. We're shooting on this date. The bus is being made. There's three seats at the back and we'd love you to be involved. And um, and um, and it, it was just a different way of approaching it. And it, it worked really, really well. We then went on to raise other funding, but it was much easier once we had cinemas involved. That's brilliant. And in, yeah. And in, in this instance with the MSO, they have wonderful connections with all the touring sort of um, managers and all the venues they've played at over the years. And so our aim is to make this film and then take it on tour with a smaller reduced version of the band. So we might go around, we might tour with a 16 piece band, show the movie and then have the band come on and play afterwards and do a Q and a, and really uh, let it be an experience. Cause this is the thing I'm enjoying more and more is when, when you can somehow couple the act of making film with an experience that that you can hold dear to your heart, you know, because at the end of the day, it is all just faces and places, and uh, and I and I that's for me, it's about just trying to find a way to not make it a grind because so much of it is. <laughs> well, you're onto something really great, I think, with the Scar Orchestra film. It's really, uh, I mean. Is that little piece something that is like for popular consumption? Can we post that yes, link can, to that so people can, can see what we're talking about? Yeah. I mean, I wish I was organised enough that I could actually run stuff while we're talking. That would be just great. But, <laughs> but I'm afraid this, this is, that's way beyond me at the moment. Maybe one day. I need a team behind me before I can do that on live, on live streams, you know. But, but you can see it down there or whatever, wherever it appears eventually. You'll yes. be able to see this wonderful little piece that, that Clay's done. Um, that's great. And I mean, um, you know, you've, you've asked, answered a bunch of my questions that I had. Um, I, I was particularly interested in how you financed um, uh, uh, um, Brothers Nest because Brothers I, Nest, yeah. yeah, because I think um, you know th- that kind of approach. I mean, it's 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 really a, a, the way we, a, an approach we have to embrace in the Aussie film industry. You know, because we don't have the studios over here. And for me, you know, it drives me nuts when I'm making my more independent films rather than the ones that I'm, you know, I have a happy, happy studio already in my, in my back pocket. Um, but it drives me nuts how I've got to go out to go find money in America, find verification of an Aussie movie, which is sometimes mm. hard because sometimes they just, they just don't get it, you know. Mm. Um, I'm doing one. My next movie is, is, is a movie set in uh, 1980s. Um, it's a sort of loosely based around my childhood, 1980s and the Housing Commission flats in, in Waterloo, Redfern, where I grew up, you know. And, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's something, it's, it's, it's like, and, and the sort of ethnic tensions that were going on at the time. And it's, 
and, and the indigenous um, aspects that were going on at the time. And it's, it's really hard to, but it's a science fiction movie, right? And it's, but it's really hard to make American studios understand that they just inherently just don't, there's a part of it they, they just don't get. They like the story and they say, can you make it, can you set it in the States? And I go, no, I can't because it's, it's about a very specific thing in my own, from my own experience, you know. So the notion of having to go out to another culture constantly to yeah. justify us making stuff here is, is a real problem. Do you think um, that'll change? Do you think that... I was well, thinking about just this last night, watching a lot of the streaming that's, that's out there yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it seems more and more like film is well, streaming. Why I'm doing what I'm doing, which is a bit like what you're doing, is for similar reasons. Obviously, the whole, you know, I, I like the idea that I can work a regular hours in, in and mm-hmm. I can go to the office, so to speak, and I'm not like driving through traffic all over town to multiple locations. I'm bringing the locations to me in a virtual production kind of mode. I really like that. That lowers the hours of the day. You can shoot the film quicker. You don't have to spend six months shooting a movie. You've got a smaller crew and all sort of stuff. And it drives the budget down, of course, too. It makes things much more affordable, yet I don't have to sacrifice the style of fantasy visual effects-based imagery that I like doing. I can still do that stuff and I can do it better and cheaply than I've ever done it before, you know. So my hope is that that will buy us a great, as filmmakers, as Aussie filmmakers, a great deal of freedom. You know, as, as Aussie filmmakers, we've always been very good at innovating and coming up with cheaper, simpler, easier, better ways of doing stuff. And sometimes we leap ahead of the big American union-driven machine because we have to, we can't, we, we have to do it that way, you know. Mm. So I hope this is all kind of hand in glove, this whole thing of building these production facilities, these virtual production facilities, dropping the budget, dropping the number of crew, the n- amount of time it takes will give us that, that, that extra bit of freedom and maybe we, we can finance them in the clever ways that you've been doing rather than going out to, uh, to, to another, say, another culture to justify what what we're doing so i hope i hope we're on the right track you know well, you and i and i hope others will follow you know <laughs> well i do too and, and 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 you know there is an enormous um there's a there's enormous sort of a community out there that are that are like what's been really interesting to me um uh, we were talking before we came on about the the sort of um, virtual production which is uh, very much what both of us have i mean i was playing around with that a couple of years ago and 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 um I got my son to hack into sort of Vive and Unreal Engine to see if we could um, marry up a virtual camera with a real camera in the studio here. And to our absolute sort of joy, we, we did cut to sort of three months later. I actually had managed to convince a uh, one of the first LED hiring screen hire places to come and actually set one up in the studio here. So I had for about for about four days, I had a four meter, a six meter by four meter um led screen in the studio here yeah. and i got to play with this technology that we've now been watching on mandalore and i think you've even used it and similar uh, you were saying with uh, irobot um what i love is that um it almost seems as though we're we're regressing back to the 1920s and the yeah. way they made films back then but with the the added bonus of everything that tech like all of the the, 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 the confluence of technology and, and you know, in the, 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 the fact that technology has got so much cheaper and so much more sort of democratized. Um, and so we're able to do um, what the big studios can do in our backyard. We literally can do that. And that's been happening for a while, but it seems in the last two years, it's kind of that bridge has been made where it can be seamless. You yeah, know, the yeah. Mandalorian example i thought was a really good one and watching how they put that together um well i love this so sti- i love the style of those of the, the sort of the golden age era of hollywood i love the, the visual style and so much so that when i was a kid and i first started doing shooting super eight movies i was trying to emulate this effect that i called the sort of floating on air effect of actors walking along in a tracking shot Yet it seems like they're out of sync with the background, the, the the street behind them, and of course I eventually find out that that's because it was this thing called rear projection. You know, I was trying to mimic rear projection in the real world. You know, that's great, and that's my mentality, and it's been my mentality since those days. Is I love that that studio based way of creating imagery, and I love illusion. 
I love the I love the magic of cinematic illusion, and so I'll try and make the real world mimic this stuff. So it's lovely coming right back to the origins of that, and suddenly we're finding that methodology actually now it can look so much better. Of course, they don't have to float on air if you don't want them to. Um, but it's it's lovely going back to that sort of way of working. I think. Well, I know. watched two thousand and one again the other day. I mean, that's the thing that I have loved about the COVID shutdown is that I've been going back and watching all the seminal films of my youth, and and two thousand and one was one of those films that absolutely did that. I thought the I remember when I saw it. I think it was about nine. I thought those monkeys were real, but I, I'm but more than that. One of the things that people don't talk about it a lot i guess but but because they they get into the sort of more sci-fi elements of the film but i remember one of the things that i was mostly taken by when i saw that film the first time were these landscapes and that setting with the with the uh you know the the um the monolith and and these these apes and yeah it it felt unlike anything i'd ever and it it had an aesthetic to it that i remember being really taken by only to find out years later it was the Kubrick front, version front projection, of, of, yeah. of, of, of LED yeah. wall. It was, uh, and the fact that the, the leopard had, in every shot, the leopard had um, those wonderful eye, that wonderful eye effect yes. where it bounced, the light bounces. And the reason for that, of course, is because the light was bouncing straight down the lens right into the leopard's <laughs> eyes. So you had the perfect cat size in every single shot that the, the, the yeah. leopard, leopard the was in. Material sort yeah, of but I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm with you. Actually, 2001 was the movie that made me want to be a filmmaker. My dad took me to that film. It can't have been on its initial release because I was 68, so I would have been too young. I think they re-released it in the early 70s, and that's where my dad took me. And I I had no idea what this thing was, but it completely blew my mind, you know, and Mm. I've been trying to put it back together since, you know. and so that that's that was a huge influence, and, and so I've I I was found out seventy two when they when they did it. That's Cause right, it, yeah, I, yeah. Because I was nine, and they played it at the Como in Melbourne. Yeah. And the other thing that I thought was fantastic was the the Como had, I don't know if you've ever been to it. It had a, a you had to go around a circular corridor to then no, curb your way them, yeah. to where the seating was. Yeah. And I remember thinking, oh my god, they've built the cinema for the film. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it, felt, <laughs> it, it all. Well, we like had a you know. we had a theatre called the Plaza in Sydney, which which um, sadly turned became a disco by the time I was in you know the disco era or whatever it was you know yeah. a teenager. Um, but it was uh, it was built for a Cinerama screen, and that's where we saw it. It was the the full curved screen wow. where they'd run all the Cinerama movies, you know. Um, but um, but yeah, it's like it's 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 that era of filmmaking. I think is wonderful. And I think look, we we both lucky. I keep saying this all the time that I think the seventies really was the the preeminent era of filmmaking. I, I think I think that's it's all been downhill since the seventies. You know, um, and uh, t- you know we were. I, I was lucky. I grew up in my formative filmmaking years in the set in the seventies, and you did too. And uh, you know, so I I grew I grew up going well. You know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest network. The Godfather. This is yeah. what filmmaking is. You know, it's like that's the standard, right? Dog yeah. Day Afternoon. That's the standard of, of films. You know, um, that's what I'm. That's the sort of movies I'm going to make when I grow up. You know, and what I find amusing is the stuff that I thought was fodder at the time is now and it's now pretty good. Oh, I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you know, like altered states. I mean, I remember thinking that was kind of, you know, it was sort of even though it was Ken Russell, it was at the time kind of considered fairly sort of common fare and um but i watch it now and it's a really terrific i watched it again the other day it's a it's such a great uh, piece of work and uh but it's you know it, it's absolutely right i mean we, we grew up in that time where you didn't know where to look for um, there were just so many so many great um directions you could you know whether it was uh Fitzcarraldo or you know or uh, you know was like the, the or european cinema or whether american cinema the English, it didn't matter where you looked, great work was being done. And you just went, when can I get my hands on this yeah. stuff? When can I make these kind of films? Absol- and, absolutely, absolutely, uh, yeah. And, and it, it is sort of, uh, I do get a little despondent. It's, it's an interesting thing that I've been thinking about lately with streaming that I think is, um, it, it, it's really, it's fascinating. It's starting to have an, a, a, a bizarre effect on me watching um it's why I think I'm enjoying going back and watching all the old films is that I know what effort I had to go to to see those films. I remember how long I waited to see those films. I remember the fanfare those films had. You know, in, in fact, many of the films that I, I'm going back and watching, 
had their own fanfare within the film. Like they had an overture at the start that kind of you were waiting and waiting and waiting for this film to start. It, there was this wonder and expectation and everything was larger than life and you had to work hard to go in and taste it. Yeah. Whereas now everything is a smorgasbord and the best of what's on offer is with the worst that's on offer side by side. And it is a smorgasbord. So, and you've got, it's $10. You walk in, $10, you eat anything you like and gut yourself. You can, you know, and I find that I, I've never left a smorgasbord in my life and felt really satisfied. I felt full, like I've gorged myself, but I don't walk away feeling like I've had a really terrific meal because it's no. me stacking stuff on a plate yeah and and but it's a, starting to have that effect yeah where I, but the whole reverence of going into a special place like the temple of filmmaking yes. and film viewing and sitting down in that dark space and the, as you say the fanfare started or you know or the tra- even just the trailers for the movies that were to, still to come and then seeing this this having this experience this experience you know it was a real experience I mean that you know, watching it at home can never can never compete with that ever. Yeah. You know, um, I'm very lucky. Maybe we need to get you. Maybe we need to get our partners to lock us out of the house at six o'clock, right? And then at eight o'clock. I don't know. That's such a good film. idea. But anyway, go yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. yeah go on. Then, then they let you in to watch the film, so that you can be yeah. sitting out there in the cold <laughs> of your house. Yeah. Just desperate to come we'll, in and. We'll sit try. Down we'll try time. that one. Yeah. We'll yeah. Try that one. I don't think it'll have the same effect. Yeah. I mean, I'm lucky. I've got a. I've got a, a nice home theater and, and a good size screen and, and all that sort of stuff. And and. Uh, but but even that is still not the same. It's not the same because, as you say, it's like. You don't earn it. You just go down there and when everyone's asleep or whatever and turn on the movie and watch it, you know. And I tend to go back to those same movies that I've grown up with that I love or mm. sometimes more recent ones that I also love and and, um, and kind of renew my experience rather than having a new experience. I don't believe the new experience is the same thing. So no. in a way, I'm watching a movie trying to put myself... I watched 2001 or something like that, trying to put myself into the, the mindset yeah. of that you know, seven-year-old kid or however old, old I was when I saw it. You know, and, and that to me is is a whole is a is a whole different way of watching watching films. You know, um, well, I don't think I've seen I don't think I've seen. Uh, well, I generally try not to see a first release film on streaming, but occasionally I've had to. Yeah, but I don't think I've had a situation yet where I've watched one and and it's given me that same no matter how good it is that it's given me that same feeling that that i get if i've taken the time to to go and see it at a cinema yeah, uh, yeah. and um so that's that's a, that's a great shame i'm not sure what will happen but then again well, this was always bound to happen i think you know cinema is sort of going down that vaudeville track you know where there's still theater yeah but it's well it's the king kongs it's the big it's not you know well i mean you've embraced though you're embracing social media and and mm-hmm. web-based stuff which is great to see that other film of yours that i saw recently the the one with the uh the zombie who's assigned to you uh yeah. that you have to look after which i thought was wonderful it was, it was hilarious um the very annoying zombie i'd say like uh, yeah, really, yeah exactly really annoying. um you know which i guess i guess was made as a web-based series or the first well, no, web-based? That, that's a pilot so right. that's a pilot for a web-based series. okay so, yeah and that was that was born out of the simple fact that my son who's now 24 who played kenny's son in the film kenny came to me and said i I'd really like to act again. I'd like to know if I could do it. And I said, well... So that's him in the in the yeah, in that film. So, Fantastic, yeah. yeah. He, he's, he's a monolith of a man. He, yeah. Uh, so we built the set here. If I switch the camera across this way, you'll see you'll, you'll see part of it there. There you go. Yeah. So that's... <laughs> then you look the other way. That's the wall and uh, the wall, one of the walls from the zombie set was all done in green. Right. And uh, it's sort of surrounded. There's a little window here and what have you. But... He's such a big bastard. I thought we'd made quite a decent sized set, and as soon as he walked in, it he made it look like a miniature. <laughs> but, uh, but um, yeah, we, 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 it was one of those things. That, it was a conversation I had with him. Basically, we're talking about zombies, and I've often found zombie films funny and amusing because I, uh, the threat of a zombie killing you, I've always wondered why is why why isn't anyone able to come up with the simple solution, which is just go out to Bunnings and buy yourself a whole lot of buckets. Because like a dog, <laughs> all you've got to do is muzzle them. As long as they can't eat you, you're fine. So just put a bucket over their head. Particularly and, the uh, slow-moving variety of zombie yeah. that's tra- the tradition of zombies before the, yeah. the more recent movies that have shown them 
oh they go fast they run fast now you know and their yes. limbs don't and their yeah. limbs don't drop off which is great you know <laughs> yes. so we, we we talked about all of that as well and then sort of so wouldn't it be funny if they weren't dangerous and they were just annoying they were literally just the walking dead and they were becoming a bit of a civic nuisance and um and really what it is the idea the theme behind it because I'm, I'm big on theme is it's a little bit like when you know so jesse plays a, a sort of a a, a, a a, de- a deadbeat kid who's just gaming and living off welfare and just doesn't see people and he just eats pizza at night and and the idea of this is that when he's forced to look after a zombie or he loses welfare it's a little bit like a friend asking you to look after their their dog and it's that thing of once you're given responsibility you know it can make you a better person and just just being forced to look after this zombie you know makes this younger guy a, 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 de- a more decent human being yeah. Which I think is funny. It is. It's wonderful, yeah. and it's it's heartfelt as well as being funny. Yeah, which is ter- yeah. which is great. You know, I mean, all yeah. the comedy references that you obviously so so dearly love uh, are very much the ones that I've always been inspired by too. It's kind of heightened comedy. It's like conceptual comedy. You know, like Chaplin and and uh, Tati yeah. and and you know Jerry Lew. I mean Jerry Lewis. A lot of it, I, I recently got the Jerry Lewis collection to show to my 11-year-old daughter. And she loves them. Some of them are great. Some of them are terrible, yes. but some of them are great, yeah. you know. Um, and, you know, obviously that's what Jerry was trying to do when he split up from his partnership with Dean Martin and he started directing and writing his own projects. He very much was moulding himself in the Chaplin, Tati, Fellini kind of area, you know. Um, but that's that sort of comedy for me is is, is wonderful, you know. Um, yeah. And uh, um, often probably not the most commercial comedy because it's a little bit kind of highfalutin for some people maybe but it's you know like the great dictator for me is is, a, is an incredible yeah. movie you know just yes. an amazing movie and and so also ahead of funny. its time as well very much so yeah yeah but yeah I, 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 the stuff i like is the the observational sort of comedy where you know often it's it's these it's these performers that have an incredible empathy um and um and and, and a really acute sense of how ridiculous we are as human beings and ultimately that's what they're often commenting on is that we are we are really strange creatures yeah and um even when we're at our best we're strange and even when we're at our worst we're stranger still and so uh, and what i loved about i agree with you i think um i was really taken at an early age by the stuff that jerry lewis was directing um you know the nutty professor and and particularly strangely enough a film called which way to the front which yeah. is, 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 is not a very good film, but yeah. it is so out there. It's so twisted. What, what's, and, the one, what's the one where he ends up in some sort of uh, house for wayward women or something? Ladies' man. Ladies' man. I mean, and it's, it's sort of this cut, incredible cutaway set, like a six-story yeah. set where it's like a doll's house and you can see into all the rooms and incredibly yeah. surreal, really weird. Um, but I remember seeing that as a kid, and and, and I, I was a huge Jerry Lewis fan when I was when I was a kid, and that one still holds up too in in, in this bizarre kind of there, there are surreal some almost d- d- Dali esque yes yeah moments in well that, there's a girl that, who that, comes that, down as a yeah. bat from the ceiling and then there's like a musical number that follows as as yeah. as, as you do you know um, it but just, it's it just uh, gags that you just go <laughs> just silly gags like when he's asked to clean the room and. And there's like a frame, a frame picture of you know butterflies. Yeah, and, they all, like, and they all fly. And he off. just he opens it up, and they all fly off. <laughs> yeah, it's and brilliant. Like, and he blows the whistle, and they all fly back. And yeah, closes yeah. The thing and, well, he, he was one of the first guys to break, the, you know, to break the fourth wall. That thing of yes. something happens, and he looks into the lens. You know. Well, his incredible popularity is what bought him that amazing freedom in 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 Hollywood. He had to make a a bunch of movies that didn't work at the box office before they started yeah. to take that freedom away from him, of course, you know. But but when he first broke away from his very successful partnership with Dino, he could, I think he could pretty much do whatever he wanted to, as is evidenced from the films, you know. And, yeah. And they continued to be successful. He was still very loved, beloved by the audience and he could really push the envelope enormously in his projects. Um, but, of course, in Hollywood, you're only as good as your last your last movie and if you if you have a few duds you you know that's yeah. all, that's all she wrote you know um but you you but then it was the then it was the joy of the king of comedy which i thought yes i, I, just, I just remember just i still love watching that because he's yeah. very much himself in that movie yes he, that's he, right he was a strange cat yeah you know? 
You really yeah. felt he, I, you know, sadly because he was so lauded in 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 in, um, in Europe and and not so in America. There was always an element of a, a chip on his shoulder. I think whenever you saw him interview, there was always an element of it was a slight sort yeah, of yeah. There's a bitterness you know, definitely with bitterness his, there, when yeah. he got older, you know. But yeah. but I understand. I mean, I I, I people. The French love me too, and no one else seems to. So, <laughs> so I, under, I completely understand. I completely sympathise with with, with, well, with Jerry. Start working on your but, bitterness. That's yeah. not coming through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's there. Don't worry. It's buried. But, it's buried, but it's there. But um, look, I, I find your whole ethos too of not just making the hours that you work and the commitment, uh, you know, uh, make it making it. So that you can actually have a family life, etc. But you know, and the fact that you include your family in the process, so so many members of your family, it, it is a real family affair, as they say, mm. the cliche, but it's very true. Um, I'm just I'm just interested in in are you, I mean, are you interested in in dabbling in that Hollywood world, or have you already decided that you've got the perfect situation, which I believe you do. Um, and and you want to stay with that sort of independent way of making films? Well, uh, no. I mean, I've I've always wanted that Hollywood experience. I mean, I've been going back and forth there ever since Kenny was made, and I've got you know I've got LA agents, and I I, I you know twice a year I'll go over and do you know do the bottle run as they yeah. say, and uh, um and I've been pitching films there forever and a day, um and I've come very close uh, a, a couple of times now, um. But, you know, like any filmmaker, the war stories are just <laughs> always, <laughs> you know, too numerous to mention. Um, you know, I mean, Brothers Nest came out of the simple fact that I was working on a project that I'd been on for 10 years and it got yanked out from under me. Can, by, can uh, you say what that project was or what sort of project it, it was? It was, a, it was a, I had the rights to a couple of books. Uh, it was about the oil trade, the oil rig uh, world, and it was... Um, it was a, a project called Don't Tell Mum I Worked the Rigs, You Think So Play Piano in a Whorehouse. <laughs> and um, it was a terrific um, a character um, where we would get a window into a, a very, very male world of, of the oil industry in the, in the 80s, uh, which you know did not have safe, the safety kind of um, mandates sure. they have yeah. now. And it was really about, you know, how does a man who is questioning his own sort of manhood and his own masculinity how does how does he form any sense of maturity when he's you know for want of a better word put in a cage full of gorillas which is what th these men you know were in this in the 80s and that they were really tough men and many of them um are fatherless and so it was a film about fatherless men that were kind of you know a, a lot of um fatherless men would sort of repeat the 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 the, um, the lifestyle of the the fathers before them and end up in these in these rigs and as one guy said he, he said you know going to jail is just this sort of um, preschool um, you know step before you go into the oil <laughs> into the uh, onto an oil rig um, so that was a really that was a project that I had been working on for a long time we got very close to financing it and uh, and it was just sort of uh, unfortunately the the uh, author of the, the books sort of took advantage of a little window in the uh in the option and uh and it was a time where there were some oil rig films being made in hollywood and he was in need of money and i think his mother was ill and so he uh he went off and sold it from under us right and, uh, yeah and uh I, I just i remember just sitting there when he told me this and uh i remember just thinking wow that's uh that's 10 years of hard slog that you know that that script is literally just toilet paper now yeah, and, um, it's ter it's very sad, but uh, but I mean I know exactly that's what common. It's a common. I, I know exactly what you've gone through. I mean I've ha it's happened to me on so many projects. I had a whole string of them. There was a, a few years between uh, my movie Knowing and when I eventually made Gods of Egypt. There was like seven years of projects being set up, being financed, being uh, rewritten, storyboarded, pre-visualized, blah blah blah, everything right yeah. up until. The point where the studio went, you know what? Nah, I don't think so. And the the ultimate one was the you know the the greatest you know insult was this project Paradise Lost that I was going to make about based on John Milton's um, epic poem, and um, you know we had it we were ready to go. We were like three weeks, six, four weeks from actually shooting the bloody thing. You know they'd spent twenty four million dollars on it, 
Um, we had it all set up, ready to go, and they decided, nah, you know what? Nah, nah, no one wants to see this. You know, we've, we don't want to spend any more money. You're a little bit over budget. Nah, let's pull the plug, you know? So that was like two years of my life, basically, evaporated in front of my very eyes, you know? Um, and it is interesting, the more you talk to filmmakers, the, this is, it's just very common. You know, it's just a very common, like at most... You know, I remember when I did Kenny, uh, it was a year after. I, I know Fred Skepsi because I, his kids were producers doing music videos and, and ads in the 80s. And I, when I was, so I, one of, a couple of their kids produced some of the stuff that I was working on. And uh, I remember saying to, to Fred, can you give me some advice? You know, I've just made this film and it's taken me 42 years to make my first feature. <laughs> um, what's your advice? He said, okay, you need seven films. And I said, I beg your pardon? He said, um, yeah, you need to put together seven films. And I said, but it's just taken me 42 years to do one. <laughs> and he said, no, you need seven. And I said, well, okay, so w w why seven? And he said, because four will die of natural causes. <laughs> You'll be left with three. The one you really want to do will get shelved. And the one you're least interested out of the last two will get up. But it'll then allow you to do Either the one that shelved, or and he couldn't have been further yeah. from the truth. I mean, he could have been, you know, close to no, the truth. No, he he, he's, he's spot on. You know, I mean, yeah. The, look, and can I? I'm just going to stop for interrupt for a moment. Interrupt us for a moment by saying, uh, there's a lot of people asking questions, and there's a lot, oh, of, yeah, please. A lot of people saying, "Hey, this isn't live. This this isn't actually live." I assume, blah blah blah. Because we're not responding to the questions, but okay. we will. I promise you, out there, out there, we will yeah. respond to the questions. Um, just give us a moment to just blab on for a bit more, and I'll go. I'll, I'll circuit back and, and look at the, look at the questions. You know. Um, yes. I, I believe there's two different ways. I believe there's that way of of, and that's definitely the tried and true way of making films in Hollywood. And then there's the other way, which I've which I've embarked upon a couple of times to, to some success. Dark City was my film that I made because literally that was something I was working on for 10 years and eventually they let me make it. It just because just out of perseverance and out of out of just being pig headed, basically, they eventually yeah. agreed to let me make it. Um, and I also made a film called The Crow uh, in the in the middle there that that was a, a terrible tragedy, of course, as everyone knows. Mm -hmm. But but it actually did well at, at the box office. So go figure. That's what makes the studios want want to make your movies and eventually I kept you know they after that there was the one occasion in my career where basically all the studios called me up and said we'll make whatever you want to make you know and I'd hand them the dark city script and they'd say well what else do you want to make you know <laughs> yeah. and, and eventually someone agreed uh new line eventually agreed to 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 let me make it you know um but but let's maybe we can let's yeah, look yeah, at some yeah. of these questions and see Absolutely. whether we can uh Makes some of these these lovely people who are watching us blab on. But but I should yeah. say the, 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 just while you're looking at the question, yeah, um, the 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 Hollywood the real answer to that was I was actually casting a a Hollywood film when the COVID sort of kicked in. Right. We had we had we had a cast sort of um uh and we were we were in the middle of you know starting to sort of cast the the, the secondary roles and uh, and yeah it just all sort of fell over and sadly you know I don't even know I'm not even sure whether or not that's going to be the kind of film that Hollywood's going to want to make after this. You know, it's these sort of events have a way of... I remember when September 11 happened, I turned to my partner and said, get ready for a whole lot of musicals and zombie movies. You know, it's like, it's, you know, uh, I don't know what an audience is going to want to watch um, after after we come through all of this, but I dare say it's going to be a lot of comedies. But I also think space movies just because people wear helmets yeah. and stuff. That's, so that's I think right. I think you're on a winner there in your in yeah, your spaceship. You. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, will we ever get a Dark City soundtrack on vinyl? Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I thought there was one on vinyl, but anyway. Um, uh, sound is gone. No, it's not. Serena Hunt, who's someone that I've uh, I've worked with. Do either of you think there is room to change the work-life balance expectations in the film industry? 12 hour plus days should not be the norm. And I feel partly responsible for why Serena maybe asked that question because I know I've probably subjected her to, to 16 or 18 hour days on, on my yeah. projects. But I think, you know, do you, I mean, do you want to have a, have a, we sort of answered it in a way, but maybe. Yeah, well, I think it's, look, it's a debate that's actually coming up. Like I, I saw an article, I'm not, you may have even posted it yourself, I'm not sure, but it was, uh, it was a crew member from Hollywood 
um, saying, yeah. oh, "Dear Hollywood, an editor, yeah. I, I don't want things to go back to normal." Yeah, I've been, you know, I remember when I was I was shooting a commercial in New York years ago, and we had we locked down Times Square, and it was a very exciting moment. We had a lot of really terrific crew on board and they were very good at what they was a couple of sort of oscar winners as they kept i remember the sound recordists as um boom op kept telling me you know this is an oscar winning a sound recordist and which was quite amusing because later in the evening he actually one of the spools shot off his nagra and took <laughs> off down 42nd street and i he was running after it as it unfurled and i remember leaning over to the producer said Oscar winner. Um, <laughs> but at the time, what was interesting, one of the crew members asked if it would be okay if they could, if they could use me as an excuse to travel to Australia. Would I be willing to put on a piece of paper that, that he's coming over to work for me on a film? And I said, what do, what do you mean? And he said, because if I'm seen to be going on a holiday, then it's deemed that I'm not serious about the industry and I won't get back in. It has, it has to look like I'm actually on a job. And that was my first window into how, you know, pervasive all of that is in, in, in the States. But I think that this new sort of thing that we're talking about, it's what I've been road testing this with music videos. So I've been shooting in this studio for 10 years now. And what I do with music videos, which, of course, no one makes any money out of anyway, is you used to think that I used to think this is ridiculous. You're working on a music video. There's no money in it. And yet we're going through all the same pain that everyone goes through on a shoot. You've only got one day because there is no money. So what I used to say to the bands very quickly was I'd say, OK, how much have you got? They'd say somewhere between three and five grand. I go, OK, here's the deal. You're going to come and stay with me for two, two days. We're going to shoot for two days in the studio and we're going to start at 10 in the morning. We're going to finish at four. And on the evening of the first night, we're all going to um, I've got a music room. If you want to play some music, you can. But we're going to sit around. We're going to drink red wine and we're going to talk about our lives. And um, and then we'll the second day will be much more fruitful. We'll all know each other a little bit better. Everyone can throw ideas into the mix and then you'll go away. And then I'll spend the next three months cutting this and putting it all together in and amongst all my other work. And I got to tell you, it's, you know, I did quite a number of music videos and my family would crew on them as well. And I'd bring, uh, you know, friends in that would DP and what have you. But what we managed to do was, um, you know, I was able to pay people um, a, a reasonable wage, but for less hours, you know, it was, it was spread over two days. And what I found interesting was in many cases, the crew were more willing to work on a two day shoot where they were really sensible hours. Um, than on one day that just nearly killed, killed Yeah, absolutely, killed absolutely. Um, and, I, you know, I remember from my music video days, we'd, we'd work around the clock. We really would, like, we, that's all we could afford is a day, and then we'd just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and the crew would be there. And, the, like, the DP would come up to me at one stage and say, um, I've got to go. And I go, what do you mean you've got to go? He goes, because it's call time for my next shoot, like tomorrow, <laughs> now. I've got to drive across town. So it's kind of crazy. But what you're suggesting, what you've just described is is almost like the home uh, home studio model for musicians, you know, which is one that, yes. you know, as, as a technology become, our technology becomes sim- smaller, more affordable, et cetera we can adopt that sort of homegrown studio way of working, you know, mm. and traveling somewhere like to your, to your place, uh, getting out of going out of town or whatever and, and staying somewhere and working is, is a, is a wonderful way of, of, of making films, you know, if you mm. can, if you can make it, make it work that way, you know? Um, well, Brothers Nest, I mean, I mean, to answer the question on, on, a, on a regular film, Brothers Nest, we shot, uh, we shot two nine, nine hour days and three 10 hour days. Um, uh, and that was how we structured it. And we also took over a um, caravan park uh, where we we put everyone up for four nights a week. And um, it was it was great. We so I brought a whole lot of my musical instruments along. They had this enormous sort of common room, and uh, we'd have uh, movie nights and pizza nights and music nights. And uh, it was you know I think you can you can make the, the you know a film set you know you, you've got to have the right producer that's willing to to do you know we we, we put on a concert when we were making um brothers nest you know the 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 composers the composer had written the opening theme music and the and uh the end title music and i said but you know and it was um recorded with uh, a couple of fellows and i said would you be open to the idea of coming on set and and actually performing them 
Um, and they said, yeah, that'd be great. So while we were shooting in one room, we set up uh, a, a small amount, a little lamp, and, a, 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 and the, the, music, the composer came in with a couple of his friends. And I said to everyone, drop your tools. Uh, we've got a little 10, 15-minute concert. And uh, they played the opening theme. And uh, now it was only a 15-minute break or a 20-minute break. But it, it really went a long way in, you know, the crew really loved that. We did another thing, too, that I don't think anyone else has ever done. In Brothers Nest, Shane and I are wearing these, these orange suits the whole way through. And so what we decided to do was that every crew member at some point had to don an orange suit. We'd kind of warn them about an hour before, okay, it's you today. Put on the orange suit. And somewhere in the next two hours, we would get them to step in and do a line of dialogue from the film opposite either Shane or myself. <laughs> And um, so, when we had, so you have a ver- do you have a version of the film, like the yeah, whole film? Yeah, the little, fantastic. The, the equivalent yeah. of like the old Super Eight <laughs> condensed versions. We've got the Rat Party version. That's hilarious. Which, yeah, know, yeah. And uh, but I do think it has to change. I mean, the COVID thing is interesting with all the dialogue about. I've got a, a few friends that have been working on, you know, some films during the COVID. You know, and what they're absolutely telling me is that you only get one third of what you normally get done in a day done with the, with the new rulings. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's, that's why I think we have to come up with an, another way altogether that's diff, altogether different, um, because I think um, uh, you know that's that's kind of not really going to work, is it? I mean, that's going to no. add so much to the budget, you know. So, and so look, so you know, we're, we're, we're on a film set knows that, that. Like I was saying to someone the other day, you know, we've got this thing called stuntmen. You know, and I actually watched yeah. the movie Stuntman the other day. I said, it, it's a little bit like, you know, how when people tell you in Japan, there's a word for dying on the job, you know, um, well, we have a, we, there's a role called the stuntman. And the whole idea of that is they've signed waivers so that if, you know, and sadly you've experienced this is that if, if one of them, if, if a, if a stuntman gets ill or hurt, on, then you'll keep filming. That's the lunacy of our business is that it is so hard on everyone, the hours and this machine, this monster that we build, has to keep moving forward, yeah, yeah. regardless of who falls off. Well, I, and- yeah, I refuse to ever put anyone in the the line of of, of possible uh, injury ever. Um, no, no. Uh, you know, I learned but that, but I learned that the the hard way. Yeah. Um, yes. But you know, it's it's um it's uh it's I think the methodology for making films is pretty hard to change unless you change everything you, yep. it's hard to impose uh, you know like a, a a pandemic nazi or whatever the person's role is going to be to stand there on the set and go no no camera crew must be six meters apart or whatever. It's, it's not going to work they all have to work around the same camera you know so so then yeah. then you go okay well you, you 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 rip it all apart and you build it from the ground up and yes. and Strangely enough, this new way of working in these very small um, productions, virtual productions, where you can bring the locations to the crew, cast and crew, you don't travel around a lot to a lot of a lot of different places and encounter a lot of different people. You're a very tight knit little family group, yes. a dysfunctional family group. You can all get tested at the beginning. If you can, if you can um, put yourselves into some sort of isolation on someone's property, even better. Um, yeah. But even if you if you're still working in the city, I think the fact that you have so few people working on the production, and you know you test them every second day or whatever you have to do, and you know there are there are ways of doing it, and you you know if you've only got one person doing camera, you know you've only got one person doing makeup, you know it it becomes a much more um, controllable uh, situation, you know. I totally agree with you. I think that that's the only way. It can be it can be done, really. I think um, hopefully they'll come up with some way of being able to. The biggest problem, of course, is that, is how long it takes to actually find out whether someone has the illness. That's the biggest hurdle at the moment. If 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 they get to a point where they can sort of narrow that time down to to like you know if there's some way where they can actually find out what there that there are actually subtle symptoms that come into play even a day after you've yeah, contracted it, yeah. then it'll make things a lot easier. Well, to, well, we, we hope you know. so. I'll ask yeah. a few more questions. This one's this is, this, is, this one's going to, to stroke our egos. Thank you, Fabio De, De Niro, if that's your real name. This is amazing. Two of the most switched on commercial minds of Australian cinema. Thank you. We'll t- we'll take that that cool. uh, that accolade. Yeah. Do either of you have a dream project? Um, well, do you want to? Maybe you should answer that question. Yeah, uh, my, mine's a, a, a film called Binary, 
um, which, again, we've come close to getting up a couple of times. Um, it's set in the future. It's about a detective that that um, finds a slither of skin in the eye socket of a, of a, of a, of a victim, uh, and it helps. And basically what the, the detective decides to do is clone back um, the, the killer to, to best try and ascertain what the killer might look like or, or, or understand. But what, the, what, what happens is they, they end up cloning this man-child, and um, it's really a, a story about parenting in a weird sort of way because this detective who is not particularly good socially um, has to spend time with this clone who is unaware that it's actually cloned from a killer. It has, and so it's a whole look into nature versus nurture, and it's the Frankenstein sort of construct. And um, but it's about the irony that you know the best relationship that this de- detective ends up having is with its uh, with its own creation, which is you know kind of you cool. know, parenting sort yeah. of thing. So yeah, there's that. Yeah. That's, what about that's what great. about what about what well, about yourself? I'll answer it in the way Alfred Hitchcock would always answer the question when he, when he was sitting on the set. They someone would walk up to him and say. Mr. Hitchcock, what are you thinking about right now? And he goes, my next movie. Because, um, you know, the whole thing with Hitchcock, of course, is once he'd done all the storyboards and stuff, the movie was done. The acting was... Yes. The acting part and the shooting part was kind of like just a formality, a mere formality. So, so mine is my next movie, um, my dream project, which uh, is the one that I mentioned to you, set in the 80s, etc. Yeah, great. Um, which I will not divulge any further any further plot information, no. unfortunately. Um, because I, I did for many years, I did want to do a film on Dali, um, because um, there was that period of time where Dali was with Walt Disney um, uh, working on yeah, Destino, Bruno, yeah. and and at the same time, around about that same time, he was also working. Was it Spellbound with uh, Hitchcock? Yeah, uh, yeah. He designed the, he designed that little dream sequence. Yeah. And what was interesting is they actually placed Dali in, into the care of one of the animators from Disney, who was this kind of very humble kind of middle middle western sort of american guy who's very so got got lumped with this maniac yeah. and and so basically you've got a movie where it would all be seen through the eyes of this Walt Disney sort of animator who is having to deal with Dali Walt Disney and Hitchcock yeah and then and what i thought would be amazing would be if the film had fantasy elements that encompass all of their styles. Yeah, and, no, it's a, uh, I, know, I know a lot about all that stuff. I, I, I we should make that movie together because uh, yeah. I'm, I'm actually a big Bunuel fan, and and so Dali, I'm a Dali fan as well, of course. But Dali's kind of the bad guy. Bunuel is a good guy, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I, for many years, I, one pro- a project I've been wanting to make is not so much about Dali, but about the surrealists in Paris yeah. in the twenties and. The only way, I've I've written rewritten it so many different times, you know, basing it on fact and biography, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And my last version is actually the one I'm still pottering away with to this day, and probably will potter away with till the day I die, or at least I should probably get it made fairly soon if I can. Is that the surrealists in Paris all discover that they're superheroes? They all have superpowers. Um, <laughs> so so that's one. That you know, but try and picture that one to Hollywood. It's like, yeah, yeah right. You know, that's that's going to work. Um, okay, let's see if there's another question. Um, oh, there's some actually. There's a hilarious one in here that someone goes. You know, I used to have a website. I started it up in the late '90s called Mystery Clock, like what this mm. channel, this YouTube channel, is called now. And it's my production company. And uh, we were like, we were the fir- one of the very first filmmakers' websites, you know, to the point where I just couldn't afford to maintain it. I, I had to give up after a few years. I just couldn't afford to run it. We were producing content for it or whatever. But if I kept it going, we could have been YouTube now. I could have been Mr. YouTube. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. But we, I had a forum on there called Ask Alex, and people could ask me questions. And someone here has gone, I can't find the question now, but I saw it pop up early on. He goes, well, this is a damn sight better than Ask Alex where <laughs> – where you ask a question and it took three months to get a reply, you know. <laughs> At least it's like you get it live, you know. But I can't. I, we can't possibly answer all these questions. So sorry that we're jumping over all this stuff, guys. Um, I don't know what this. There's a whole strand about junk food and eating junk food on the set, and I've got oh, okay. no. I've got no idea what that's all about. Well, I always remember that when that when Spielberg was out doing um, what was it Brothers in Art? No, what was the war film they did? A, a parrot, um 
Pacific. The Pacific? Yeah. Is that the, the, they did that out here? Yeah, that's I right. Remember, yeah, the Pacific. I remember yeah. a whole lot of crew members telling me that their favourite thing about working on it was the Spielberger. You know, the junk food that they had on production that they... Yeah. And the fact that the, 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 fact that, um, the craft services are open 24 seven on a, on an american production whereas here we have oh that's of, bad have you been on yeah. one of those productions that's bad no, i don't i i i, I, I tried to ban that stuff like well that's what i ended up really looking like you know <laughs> because it's just it's like this food anytime you go to the bathroom there's food you can grab it on the way back you know and stuff you gob again it's like craft service is the most evil vile invention in the Hollywood, <laughs> Hollywood film industry. You know, no, I mean, we, we've always eaten very well in the Aussie film industry. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, look, I did a bunch. I did a lot of commercials in the early days, and so we had really good caterers. I mean, we were really yeah. spoiled, you know, uh, for for quality food. I think what they were saying, and I can't be bothered going back through all the questions to find the the uh, the the strand. So I do apologise, but I think they were saying how you know our concept of uh, having a uh, having a small film crew and and isolating ourselves is sa- is going to save us from getting COVID nineteen. But you know, partly, I mean, what and and we're getting people from all over the world for these questions too. There's probably yes. someone in in the US who's up watching this stuff, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much for yeah for up watching it at a weird hour. Um, but you know, in Australia, just for the people who don't know, um, because our situation, you know, we get a lot of news about the US and everywhere else. But I know from living in the US that y- the people in the US don't get a lot of information about what's going on in Australia unless there's like a massive bushfire or something, you know. Um, but we're actually doing, you know, touch wood, we're actually doing okay. You know, we lock down and all that sort of stuff. Melbourne's having a little bit of a uh, a resurgence in it at the moment, um, but it seems to be very focused. Um, but but most of Australia, we're you know as I say, touch wood. But we're we seemingly starting to come out of this thing. I hope we all hope you know, um, and you know we 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 have to be able to start shooting. You know, some productions have have started again. I don't know how on earth they're doing it. Um, actually, I do know I've spoken to a few people who've who've shot who shot through the the complete lockdown and. They had the nurses on set and all that sort of stuff and isolated people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, um, you know, we have to come up with new ways. I mean, it's like we, we just don't know how long this thing is going to go for. And, I, you know, I, I'm, not like, um, I'm not like Trump or anything like that who goes, you know, you just have to ignore it and keep moving on. But to a certain extent, we've got to come up with new ways to protect everyone so that we're doing it in a safe way. But we have to evolve you know otherwise we you know who knows we'll never make another movie again you know we'll never make well, another film every, again everything in life is a calculated risk yes everything yeah. and um you know i was sort of i worked out the odds i'm looking after my father he's he's 85 and as soon as this all happened i, I brought him up to the home here and and he's been i've actually set him up with his his own uh, little cinema in his room he's got a big screen there and he loves western so he He's actually he's, he's actually a, he's a great actor. Westerns. He's a great actor. He's really he's very charismatic. I must say. Yeah, yeah. He's, well, he's very natural. He well, he was acting in films when I was ten. So he was, uh, um, you know, the, 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 actually the reason why I got into film is when really? I found out that my right. father. Yeah, because yeah. he was a, a boxing trainer back then, and he got a role in a, a, a film in the in the corner ring of a, a film called Come Out Fighting. Yeah. And um, and I remember they came home one day and I was there with the babysitter and I said, where have you been? And they said, oh, you, my mother said, oh, your father's been in a movie, we went to the premiere and, it, and my jaw hit the floor. I just thought, no one from the western suburbs of Melbourne ever, is ever in the movies, yeah. let, let alone my own father. Yeah. And so that kind of set everything off and running. But um, no, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's interesting. It's I was sort of working out with him that, you know, there is more of a risk of him getting hit by a car when he would travel up here of his own volition when when the virus w- wasn't around yeah. then there is him getting the virus yes. but you know but you've just got to take a, a calculator at some point we have to yeah we just have to take a re- I had my first night out where I went to a restaurant with my partner in 4 months and it was glorious it's amazing how much we take for granted you know in life and then when something as simple as just being able to sit across a table that isn't your, your your own kitchen table, yeah, and have a have a meal was really it was really amazing. It's a very surreal to go through all this stuff. Everyone's going through the same thing. I mean, we had a during the lockdown, we actually had a um a, a Zoom dinner party 
which seemed like a good idea at the time. We had a bunch of friends in different locations, and we actually, my wife actually sent out a, a menu to everyone so everyone could cook the same meal. Yeah, right. And it was like it was like something really complicated, like spaghetti bolognese or something, you know. Um, and we're there with our friends, drinking wine and seeing them on the screen, and and it kind of got really depressing really fast, you know. It's also they get fatigue, right? You get yeah, you get fatigue like any of these sort of streaming things that I find after about two and a half hours, you know. And then you get that awkward thing of who's going to turn off the telly? For, That's like, right. Who's, yeah, who's saying goodbye? For, you know. But we did one, and it was it was actually a lot of fun. It was um. We, we kept what we we're eating a surprise and then to each other and uh, but um, but yeah it, it is um, it's just the fatigue of it all I mean it is what is going to be known as the greatest um, time of development in the film industry history yeah. where everyone is suddenly developing stuff I'm glad I'm not a script reader yeah there's, um, there's going to be an enormous amount of I, COVID a lot of people script. though I've had a lot of feedback from people saying uh, doing just that writing because everyone's sitting at home writing or has been up until fairly recently and still doing it um, saying that they don't quite they feel kind of at a loose end because they don't quite know what they're writing. You know, it's like what you were saying before. It's like, what's the genre? What 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 is the world that we're writing this stuff for? for yes. What is the yeah. audience? What is the audience? Because you know, I mean, we all say we're artists and we're just doing our, you know, saying our thing that we want to say. But at the end of the day, you know, it's important that we're in a commercial medium and we what we want to know that the audience will want to see our little humble epic. You know, um, yeah. Uh, and so it's it's a it's a it's problematic on many levels. One, we don't know what that what that world is going to be. We don't know whether this the cinemas are ever going to be a, a commercially viable. You know, I don't know how these cinemas that are opening up, where they've got you know four seats that are blank between each, empty between each, you know, filled seat, etc. And then it's also that thing of you know what is it that the world is going to want to watch and. Yeah. What is that audience exactly, you know? But isn't it ironic that, um, I mean, I don't know why, personally, I don't know why the cinemas weren't given a, a, a free ticket during all of this, because I don't know about the cinemas that you frequent, but the ones that I go to, I'm always usually one of only 10 people. Yeah, in there anyway. that's true. That's and true. Um, that's been the, the, the case for the last couple of years. So I've, I was sort of, as soon as these things started, I really had hoped that they might have got some kind of exemption where... They've got the capability to actually put you in 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 in, in designated seating. Yeah. Um, and it would have been very easy to have people three, four seats apart from each other and still not, you know, still not have a full house. So, or maybe those uh, shields, those plexi shields that they have <laughs> at the checkouts, you know. Or maybe they just between... go to Bunnings and get a whole lot of those whippersnipper gu- uh, face guards. Yeah. Just hand those out at the cinema. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, let's see what else. What other questions we got from people? We'll answer like a few more. I think we've hit the hour fifteen. Time flies. Um, uh, would you be more interested in doing a five million dollar movie for Blumhouse, or rather, making something in the hundred million range? Well, let's take the Blumhouse thing out of that statement. Would you be more interested in doing a five million dollar film? Where we. I mean, look. From my point of view, I've uh, the the most as, as we said, the most freedom I've ever had is on the lower budget movies, where they just yeah. let, they, they let you do what you want. As the budget goes up, the more you have people fearful of losing their jobs if the film doesn't work, so they're second guessing you, micromanaging you. It's a it's a complete schmozzle, a complete nightmare. You know. So I know what I I know the work, way I I would prefer to work from here on out, and and also in a way the way I have to work from here on out. Not just because of the pandemic, but because what I do, which is original, big scale science fiction fantasy, original being the key word, ain't going to happen anymore. That's that's mm. dead. That's gone at the cinema. Okay, sadly, I know from my own personal experience in the last few years, no one wants to make those movies. They've got to be science fiction or whatever. It's got to be part of a franchise otherwise or something or a remake or something based on existing IP that people are really uh, are really aware of, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So I know where I'm going, so maybe you should answer that question. What, which way would you like to work? You know? Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I, I spent three months in L.A. last year trying to get, you know, a big Hollywood film up and running. And, and most of my life as a filmmaker has been geared towards that. So from a very young age... All I wanted to do was make the kind of films that I grew up uh, watching, the films that, you know, that 
that truly inspired me. You know, the, the you know, uh, you know, whether it was Close Encounters of the Third Kind or, you know, even films like The Great Escape, stuff like that. I, I wanted to know what that was like. And all of my training, you know, when you train, it's a little bit like, you know, when you go to boot, you know, so much of filmmaking is like your own personal boot camp for whatever it is that you hope to one day do. And, and you know, you're always aware that you're training to, to, to enter that arena. And the arena that I've always hoped I would one day enter is that large scale for no other reason but other than to tell a, a, a larger scale story, the kind of story that, you, that you, you've told many times, and to sort of see how I might survive in that, in, in, in that, um, that, that f- forum. I know I can make films on a low budget. I mean, Kenny was made for 500,000. Uh, Brothers Nest was made for 2 million. Um, uh, the, the next lot of films that I'm, I'm trying to get up are around the $5 million mark. So the answer to the question is, I think the next one will be around the $5 million mark mark um if i if i'm ever given an opportunity to to do a larger film i'm hoping binary will be it um but at the same time i've got to an age where i'm okay if that never happens because those kind of tentpole movies you know have changed so much and and the kind of stuff that is actually inspiring me again and the stuff that's getting me excited is the smaller the smaller films where, where the technology is allowing you to do really good work uh, at, at, at a budget. I want to specialise in low-budget tentpole epics. That's my area <laughs> yeah. of, of expertise, I feel, in, in the future. <laughs> Fabio De Niro, who uh, I suspect is someone that I know because I, I just don't believe that's his real name. Maybe, Fabio, you can answer whether that's your real name. Um, do you think Australia's government film funding has a problem with identifying and backing real talent? Which I think is a very good question. Um, do you want to offend people by answering that question or do you want me to offend people by answering that question? <laughs> oh, no, it's very unfair to just have you offend. Yeah. Um, oh, look, I've always, I've always had a, a bit of a love-hate relationship with the funding bodies because, you know, as I've often said, you know, overseas, you know, Hollywood is a business, Whereas Australia, you know, we're very, very lucky because we're a country where the, you know, we get government support. But the negativity of that is so often the the way these things are structured are a little bit like, you know, it's a public service. And uh, my dad worked in the public service for 35 years, and he continually tells me when he watches over my shoulder that, son, this is just like when I worked for the public service. It's paperwork, risk management. And um, and and passing the buck, and um, so there's there has I've the one thing I will say is that in the whole time I've been making films, I've been trying to get funding from funding bodies, and every two or three years, there's a new mandate of what will make the industry a better a better place, and it it, it never seems to reach that goal. But, but there's a lot of chasing its tail. It's like there's a philosophy, I think, that often happens with what what worked last year. We need more of those. We need more of that. We need more of that thing that worked. And the sad thing is that making films is such a crapshoot. It's such a, a, a it's such a beautiful collision of um, happenstance, um, you know, intelligence, creativity, and madness. That when something works, it it can't be replicated. It very rarely can be replicated. And I think. What's what's encouraging about what I've been seeing over the last uh, few years is that because of streaming, that everyone is taking more risk, that there is a sense that there are more genres. Um, I, I do think we are seeing more interesting product being supported by the funding bodies than ever before. I basically spent the first five years coming out of Swinburne constantly trying to get you know, what I would call entertainment funded, and I was continually told that's not what we do here. You know, we don't make we don't make Hollywood type films in Australia. We make yeah. films that are worthy, films that have a conscience, films that I went that, through that, that have... whole phase as well. So I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. And fortunately, and it's yeah, fortunately it has shifted. And I, but I think yeah. it's taken some genre based commercial filmmakers to make it shift. Quite frankly, to show mm. a new generation of filmmakers that you know it's okay to make a horror movie or a comedy or something like that. You know. Um, mm. But, um, you know, my, my feeling about that question is, is I, at, the, at the moment, particularly during this lock, this pandemic, 
I'm happy if the if the government bodies uh, support anybody in the film world. Mm. You know, I'm happy with that because that's the real key. Anybody and everybody actually is what we yeah. need. Um, so, and it seems like they're, they're also making some movement towards that in that direction in the last few days, really. It's taken them a little while. It's taken it? them way too yeah. long. Um, you know, the problem is that I think what, one of the reasons why they've really struggled to, to, to put this together is that it, I, I imagine the politicians are finding, like, I, I'm sure their day job is quite difficult in during these times. Yeah. And when they get home, all they really want to do is just sit down and watch television. Yeah. You know, so they just <laughs> want to watch, you know, movies and just take their mind off the day and not think about whether or not, it's it's valid to support the very thing they're watching. <laughs> I think yeah. I think sadly you've hit it right on the head, you know, um, because it's supposed to be free, isn't it? I yeah, mean, it all these people are doing it because they just love doing it. They don't need to be paid, you know. Yeah. They don't need to feed their family or anything like that. You well, know? It, was, it was remarkable when, when when Scott Morrison said that it won't it won't create one job. Oh, I know that was just, I, I couldn't believe that. that. Was I mean, just if disgusting. I made a film tomorrow yeah. and got my neighbor to come in and crew it, I've created a job. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, and I'd be paying him, you know, I would have been happy, even happy if they just given them the job keeper or whatever to yes. keep, to keep the casual workers, you know, with food in food on the table. And then they could come and, you know, work for me for nothing, you know, which uh, I would have been mm. quite happy with, you know, because <laughs> they'd, be, they'd be getting paid by someone else, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, we hope that, I mean, look, you know, the, the thing that people don't realise is is no one knows what talent is in the, in the people with the money, the, whether it's government bodies or film studios or, or anybody, uh, you know, like I keep saying with Hollywood, they don't, they wouldn't know a, a great script if they if it slapped them in the face on a you know in, mm. early in the morning. They they have no no one has any idea, and the smart people um, uh, actually uh, admit to that. You know, the, all the other rest of them, the, all the the other ninety nine percent of people in Hollywood um, uh, don't admit it. They believe they actually do know what a good script is, but they don't. And literally, what they rely on. I mean, the great thing about the, the, the clever thing about the Hollywood industry is early on it discovered this thing called genre, right? You mm. could It was a way to sell something, a film to someone, uh, to an audience who hadn't seen the film, you know, not just a trailer, but you had certain elements that went into that genre so they knew it was like a hardball detective movie or a, or a Western or this, and they knew kind of what they were going to get because Westerns had to sort of conform to certain things, you know, and the more they... The more we, we the, the more that was made in each genre, the genre could then evolve and become something more yes. complex. You know, in Australia, we've always you know as you, as you've said, you know, through our our early days of being in the Australian film industry, you know, they 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 decided that that was a really kind of cheap idea or something, and that we mm. had to focus on socially relevant stories about our culture, and also because. You know, we, we, we've had a hard time knowing what our culture really is. And mm. we've been on that search of this, uh, that, that, that quest for discovery and to understand what Australian art and culture actually means, you know. Yes. Um, but that was, a, I think that was a real mistake, a, an incredibly big mistake. Um, you know, as I was coming out of film school, I'm going, well, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I don't, I don't want to go and work for the ABC doing news as a camera person or something. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. So the only thing I could do is make music videos and still look to Hollywood as the place where I could one day tell the sort of stories that I wanted to tell, which was genre. You know, yes. I, I love genre and it's, it's mm. all there is for me, you know, and I like to twist genre and, and mix genre. So I, I think you're right. I think I think we're finally understanding that. And it's, it's also because... Genre is a great, a great way to get people to go and see a movie. You know, it really mm. is. I mean, it's and it's hard to get an audience for movies that are just all about social commentary. I mean, so combine genre and social commentary. You know, Dog Day Afternoon is great social commentary, um, but it's also a really great genre piece. You know, it's the highest movie gone mm. wrong. You know, it's it's a, it fully conforms to that, but it's based on a on a real story with a lot of social aspects about you know about about the the time that it took place in you know so 
I think we can still continue to learn, but I think we're, we're, we're getting better at it. In I think it's also, it just takes bravery at the end of the day. Um, like I, I was lucky enough to meet up with Ed Catmull, who uh, was running, probably still is running Pixar, Pixar and I had a, a meeting with him and I was asking about, and he was asking me questions about the Australian sort of industry and, and I was asking about how they get things up. And, and uh, you know, I was learning that a lot of anim animation in America is all internal culture. You know, they don't go seeking scripts from outside. It's very rare that an animation is, is brought in from an outside script. It's nearly always... And, and the way he, he explained it is that, you know, we, we have a culture of understanding of how our films are made. And what we do is we put a collective of people together that we feel uh, um, create a, a fascinating soup. And we trust, we entrust in those people that they will generate something of, of worth. And we're not making children's films. We're making films, we're making uh, animations for adults that children will enjoy. enjoy. And um, and I, I remember sort of telling him about you know, the frustrations I often have with being coupled with script editors. That, you know, and uh, I had I had a, a Hollywood producer ask me. Uh, he said, "I don't mean to be rude, but can I ask why is so much Australian product comfortable?" He used the word comfortable. I said, "That's a really fascinating." Uh, word and I said, look, all I can sort of say is that there are there are often so many chefs involved and so many d d decision makers and so many gatekeepers that you know if you're having to put on a meal for 20 people, the chances are you're going to be eating pizza. So I said, we make really great pizzas, and unfortunately, all the rough edges get sawn away. And uh, and and the thing that he that uh, Ed Catmull couldn't believe was that we were we would. Um, get these external script editors that would have this heavy hand on say on how that project would be steered and he and he said to me so you could spend uh, the rest of your life every day of your life g giving a script to a different script editor and because of their life experiences their sensibilities what they like and don't like you would be chasing the tail of that editor for forever and a day um and just the last thing I'll say about uh, funding bodies, I actually did have a really wonderful experience. Well, I've had great experiences with all of them, but one particular was with the South Australian Film Corp, where I actually had this remarkable moment where we put in a, a proposal. And there was a number of producers and, 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 and writers involved, and I was part of it. And, um, and we put in this proposal, and we got this extraordinary response back, which I thought was really beautiful, which was, um, look, we've looked at the project. We don't get it. <laughs> We don't, <laughs> we don't see what it is that you see in it, but we're impressed by the group that have, like we're in, impressed with the, the group and we believe that you are seeing something as a, as a group that is worth, um, is worth supporting. And they did. And I thought that was incredibly uh, brave and, um, and is the kind of thing that how if I ran if I ran a funny body how I would kind of like to do just look at the well, look a, at the team and, and 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 the and the cachet there it's actually honest it's completely honest and a, yeah. a point I didn't make before when I was talking about about how Hollywood works and how no one knows what a good what a good script is is the 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 smart people who who admit that they don't know what a good script is also admit that the reason they're financing your next movie is because you just made a shitload of money on your last movie and <laughs> you might make them a shitload of money. And that's all there is to it, you know? Mm. And that's that's what makes them pick ideas. That's that's why the rise of the franchise has happened and the tent pole, the um the the the, 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 the series, the you know, the fran the franchise. Um, because it's a no brainer. It doesn't take a genius to go if you would make a Avenger, another Avengers movie, most people, many people will go and see it and pay us lots of money. You know, it's really easy. It's like making another episode of a long-running successful TV show. You know, um, so so that that doesn't encourage originality, unfortunately, anymore because mm. people are not willing to take the risks that they used to take in the financing financing area. So. Uh, you know, so it's in many ways it's it's um you know it's it's the honest version though, which is if you can yeah, make the money, if they think you can make the money, not if you make the money, but if they think you can make the money, they'll they'll make your movie. You know, they'll finance your movie. Mm. So, um, Jason Walsh with governments, we'll just we'll answer like three or four more questions, and I think mm -hmm. we'll uh, with governments funding cuts. Do you think there will be a surge in private investors? I don't understand why there's a correlation there. 
Um, in Australia, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't believe that, the, you know, private investors, I mean, I don't know what that is in Australia. I mean, you were very clever, Clayton, in terms of how you financed the, through the theatres, as you were saying, um, That, but that's kind of a genius. And I don't know that it's something a lot of people would think of and a lot of people could probably do again, you know. Um, but um, there, I, and I know some, I know of some s- specific situations where people have gone to, certain groups like the you know the retired Aussie military to raise financing mm. for, for for like a movie about about um about uh, a, war, a a battle in Australia's uh, Vietnam history um etc um so so you know there are moments like that but I I don't know that there are that, that it's going to be a common thing I look I'm a big advocate for bringing back the old fashioned TMBA I mean I think to me, that's the the only way we're going to encourage people to invest in 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 Aussie movies. That is private backers. Um, it, it's it, there's really no other way of, of doing it. I mean, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. you know the the thing. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, even when we made Kenny, um, it was one of those bizarre situations where we it started off as a short film, and we had a screening, and I had a, a, a guy come up to me and say, "Look, I'm sitting with a." a rather wealthy family that have been watching your short and they think it should be a feature film and they're very interested and they want to put money into it. And I then went up to Glenn afterwards who ran Splashdown, the toilet company. I said, is this true? And he said, yeah, they want to put a million dollars in. And I said, are these friends of yours? And he said, yeah, they're really good friends. I said, well, they'll never see a cent of that back, you know. And I, and I said, look, I don't, no, not only that, I don't know if there's a film in it. And we ended up going over to his place and having dinner with him. And he, we tried to talk him out of it, strangely enough. And it was only when we found out about the uh, Toilet uh, Expo in America that we thought, <laughs> well, actually, there is an idea in this. So I thought the 47-minute version I'd done was two minutes too long, so I didn't think there was a feature in it. But when I found out about that, I thought, oh, actually, you know what, fish out of water, this could actually work. Um, but I don't need that kind of money. And as a result, you know, every time I've I've – been talking to investors i'm always very upfront with them and and they're usually very savvy people anyway they know damn well they're not making money out of your 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 project they're usually entering into it because uh, of bragging rights or just because you know in in in, uh, in glenn's case he was completely aware that he could have lost every cent that he put into making kenny which was about five hundred thousand. but as he said that he had been you know working in toilets for since he was 16 years of age, he saw something in Shane and I that he liked and trusted. And as he kept saying the whole time we were making the movie, he said, what an interesting ride. What a great journey. Isn't this a great journey? And I go, it is, but just remember, you may not see a cent out of it. He said, that's okay. It's a great, great journey. I've gone into this knowing that. Well, you've discovered the you best know. possible patron, patron yeah. Yeah. in that sort of situation. I mean, yeah. I've had a, I've had a couple of instances, not, nothing to that degree, but I've had a couple of instances. Most people just want to exploit me and get every every dollar out of me that they possibly can, <laughs> um, and that's that's the reason they're they're, they're doing it. You know, um, look, I I, I, um, I think there's got to be a better model for a, a, other than ten ba. I think there's got to be a better model, and as much as I'll crap on about you know, streaming and everything. And I don't particularly like the idea. I mean, I love, we, you know, we, we love that old fashioned theatrical presentation. I mean, I think, I really think the, there might be some answers. Uh, if there are some answers, we're going to find them in the, on the internet, really. Um, you know, when I started up this website in, uh, in the late nineties, I, I honestly, and you know, we would post like these stamp size images of, uh, or like movies that were, running at like 12 frames a second or something like that, you know, because it was the dial-up era where, you know, you hear the dial tone when you log on, you know. Um, so so we were pretty ambitious uh, to do something like that in that in that era. Um, but the reason I did it is because I really, as soon as the internet started becoming sort of all pervasive, I thought, well, this is the answer. It's like eventually you'll go, gee, I feel like watching a Steven Spielberg movie, um, I'll log on to stevenspielberg.com and see if there's a new movie or I'll hear about the movie and I'll go go and watch it, you know. And I thought this is definitely where we're going to end up. You know, now the, the corporations came into that mix and took control as they so, they so cleverly do with yes. uh, with Netflix and all that sort of stuff. But, but I still have hopes that maybe there is some model 
we can build that gives filmmakers that degree of freedom that can it's like some sort of weird composite between like a Vimeo and a and a Patreon and a Netflix so you can get your movies financed get your projects rather financed uh, uh, crewed up and distributed all through mm. one kind of Bitcoin style, I don't know, yeah. economy that I don't un- even understand what that means. I just like throwing out jargon. Um, but I-, I just feel like there is something to be built somewhere for really clever people to Ooh, come up with. You know? when, it was exciting when um, Vimeo came out with the idea of democratizing, you know, like I, I immediately put some stuff on it and um, about five years later had made $2.00. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, because this is the the sad thing with um, with all of this is there's so much. It's it's how do you get seen? You know, when we were when we were younger, it was so hard to get your hands on a 35 mil camera and film. And if you could somehow manage to make a movie, you knew it would get an audience. You know, the festivals would play it. There weren't that many films being made. Now it's the reverse. It's it's not that hard to make a movie, but it's near impossible for it to be seen. Yes, and um. And it's a little bit like, a, you know, someone was like, I, I learned this the hard way with a thing. I, I did a, you're talking about epic filmmaking on a small scale, was an idea I had when I did this comedy thing called Morty Coots 10 years ago um, with Shane. It was a, a sort of a war spoof. Yeah, it's this, great. I've seen it. Yeah. This, the yeah. stupidity of men. And, um, and I thought, why does YouTube have to be just these little how-to videos? Why can't we do sort of epic story? And I learned the hard way that, that on things like you know Facebook, YouTube, it's a little bit like going to the tip with a hundred dollar note and getting all excited and putting it on top of the rubbish and standing there and going, I can't wait to see the look on the person's face when they come and they find that hundred dollar note. Yeah. But what they do is they come with their trailer and dump <laughs> all of their stuff <laughs> over that hundred dollar note, and that's where it'll stay. Um, and so I think often a lot of Good stuff. Like I, I feel this a lot with Vimeo. I'm often amazed when I, every now and then, I'll go just, I'll just go floating through Vimeo looking for short films that have been made, and it always astounds me the quality of yes. some of the stuff on that that it's you've never impressive. heard about. Yeah. That you've and you go, that's a filmmaker that's out there that should be making feature films because this is extraordinary talent. But I've never heard of him. I've never seen this. I've never heard it talked about. It just gets lost. But, you know, that's the same on Netflix, you know. I mean, it re- literally projects get dumped or Amazon or something. Projects mm. get, get lost there amidst the the algorithm. You know, the algorithm pushes to the fore the popular stuff and and everything else sort of seems to get, to get buried, you know, and you've got to surf around trying to find that thing. Yeah. And it's only when you hear about it promoted that you go, gee, I must watch that show or whatever, you know. Um so it's it's a problem just with the sheer quantity of stuff, you know. I mean, I used to joke, I used to say, because I've, I've, I'm a big music fan as well, and I feel like music has been in some sort of doldrum now for quite some time. Um, and I don't think it's just because I'm an old fart, but I think it's really because it, it really is, you know. I mean, I know a lot of young young people who like music from, from other eras as well. Um, uh, and, and so I, I used to have this kind of weird thing i used to think well has all the great music now been done you know have all the great movies been done you know are we just now treading water because the the medium is such that it just can't absorb any more stuff you know Mm. um if you listen to if you watch every movie that's been made um you know up until 1990 or whatever you know I mean, that's a lot, probably a lifetime of movies, you know. Do you yeah. need more? Do you need more stuff, you know? Or can you yeah. just go back to the good stuff? And with music, it's even more relevant because I guess people, what people go for with movies is, oh, the visual effects are so much better now, you know. Well, is the story better? Probably not, yeah. you know. Um, but with music, it's like we've already achieved, you know, quality at an early point. And so uh, it feels like we're treading water to a certain extent. So do you think there's that? to take into consideration i've i've wondered that as well but then every now and then a film will come along like parasite you know and you go wow this this really feels very different to anything i've seen before yeah or or a film like mandy 
you know, with yeah. Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Where I saw that at a film festival. It was one of the greatest film experiences. They had the sound pumped up. So talk yeah. about music. No, I, I, but, but, there's yeah. Sound, but no, I, I, I love Mandy. I love Parasite too. I, I'm not saying that they, they we're not making any more good movies or good music. I think it's they, it's still out there. It's yes. still getting done. Percentage wise, is is arguable. Maybe yes. there's less good movies. But what my I guess my point is. Do we need any more good movies or do yeah. or no, good no, no, movie, no, exactly. music or do we have enough? Because it, as as you've said, it, it gets lost in the in the mix. It gets buried underneath the the mounds of rubbish, you know, or the mounds even well, the mounds of good music, stuff. You know, I mean, music is just there's just so much stuff out there, and yeah. um, you know, it's like, and then you know, at some point in the '90s, someone deemed that ugly people can't sing, and then it just you know, and and that I think has been one of the saddest things about. About music is that um is that you know can my favorite sing? my can favorite it? music has usually been sung by people that aren't particularly attractive to look at you know and uh, it's uh, but you know it's that that whole sort of pop culture thing but well my but, um, my note that I used to get when I in the music video days is just make sure you get plenty of shots of the drummer smiling so that the people know that he's got a personality like all the other band so <laughs> yeah. so that was uh, that was my contribution exactly. to the music video. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I tell you what, I, 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 not so much do I think have we got enough, but what I have often wondered, and, and this is interesting with a lot of younger uh, viewers, and particularly my son, he does not like, he does not enjoy watching feature films. He, he really wants the binge, um, and he explains it very clearly. He says, look, when I watch a, when I watch a two hour movie with your dad, um, I get invested in these characters and I almost immediately start to feel disappointed that they're going to be gone within an hour. Whereas the, the stuff that I really love, that can live in my life. These characters can live in my life for weeks on end. And I do, I, I often think that the, the, the two hour format, you know, the, the, the idea of a two hour storytelling has kind of run its race in the sense that the formula that you need to adopt, you know, the three act structure, the you know, some a turning point at the tw around the twenty five minute mark. These aren't arbitrary things that you know. The the, the reason why that those things exist is because someone's take in the old days. Someone took the, the time to get in the car, put their family in the car, go to a cinema, and if you're twenty minutes into the movie and it's not going anywhere, that that parent is thinking, I've wasted my family's time. Because we've only got another hour left of this film, and it yeah. hasn't got to any kind of point yet. Yeah, although you know the era that we've been talking about, the 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 three four hour movie was much more common than it is than it is now. Um, yes, because they everyone seemed to seemingly forgot that there was this thing called an intermission that yeah. meant that people could go to the bathroom and get another ice cream or a drink just to sustain yeah. human life for a four hour movie. You know, so. They started doing things like I remember going to see King Kong, and I and I actually went uh, Peter Jackson's King Kong, and I went there alone because I couldn't find anyone. My family didn't want to go and see it for some reason. I couldn't find anyone to go and see it, so I went alone one night because I wanted to see it, you know. And I heard about the the um, the se the um, sequence where they end up with all the spiders attacking them, which is supposed to be horrific, which is the bit that I really wanted to see, and. <laughs> But I forgot to go to the bathroom before the movie started. And that was like a three-hour movie or something. Three and, and a half. Three and a half hours, yeah. And, you know, because only Peter at that stage was allowed to make a three and a half hour King Kong, you know. Um, and so I'm, I'm busting to go to the toilet and I'm going, oh, God, I wish, I wish the spider scene would come up soon. I'm seeing like dinosaurs running around. I don't want to see this. I want to see, this, I want to see the spider scene, you know, that I've heard so much yeah. about. And eventually I couldn't, I couldn't wait and I dashed, I ran like crazy. It was a half-empty theatre. I, I ran like a maniac, went to the bathroom and, and ran back straight away to see this, the, the final bit in the spider scene finishing. So I actually timed it perfectly. I ran exactly right before the spider scene. And so bring back the intermission, I think that would... I agree. I, mean, I, would, I watched Reds last night um, and I think that was one of the last films to have an intermission. You know Warren Beatty's. Film. Yes, yeah. Um, and uh, but yeah, it's it, it. I agree with you. I mean, I do love the. I mean, one of my. I love long movies, absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, but uh, I, hate I hate TV, TV shows. shows. I hate episodic, episodic TV, TV shows, shows. 
because <laughs> t- uh, the Cohen brothers were being interviewed and they said why they they would never do a TV show, and it's exactly my sentiment because they go they like a, a story with a beginning, middle, and an end. An end is yes. really important. The ending yeah. is the most important part of a story, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it creates the whole perspective of what we've just experienced, you know. And um, and they said, well, a TV show is like a beginning, a middle, and then beat it to death, you know, um, which is <laughs> spot on. You know, it's exactly what it is, you know. It is, well, it so, can be, look, it's the thing that I think a lot of younger, uh, and, and myself included at times, I, I do like the tangential nature of it. But one of the things that, what's really interesting, is you know i think we've already kind of moved through the the the, you know the 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 you know how they were saying we're going through a golden age of television i think that's passed i I think it actually passed very quickly almost i think so too as quickly as it came i think it was deadwood was the pinnacle of it and then it because what happens of course is you know dead i thought deadwood was an extraordinary series where it was just it was just dripping with beautiful dialogue fascinating characters um, it kept on its front foot. It was good, strong storytelling at every turn. But what, what's, what's happened is it, it is sacrilege for me to ever pick up a telephone and go on social media if I'm watching a movie. I, I, I just, I, I, I never used to do it. But more and more I find myself doing it because the studios have become aware that what audiences want is binge watching. They know that their yeah. audiences want to watch six. You know, as you know, like when you'd go and pitch uh, films, uh, TV to, in, uh, to Hollywood in, in, in three years ago, they were only interested if you could um, do two seasons. Yeah, you know, you, you had to have a second season up your sleeve. Sure. Well, now they need to know: have you, you know, can you get six yeah. out of this? Yeah. But what I'm noticing is much of what I'm watching feels like a three season show that's been stretched to six or seven seasons yeah and i continually say to my partner i'll turn to vic and i'll go what the hell did we just learn in that entire scene all we've learned is that she's bought a new car and it was a 12 minute scene yeah and you know the nuances within it didn't really give us anything new it's just it's just this it's almost like watching real life yeah i mean i don't want to watch real life because my life will end before that ends. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to see stories that, yeah, as you say, ha, you know. I also think people are much more cynical about stories where nothing really happens. Um, I think that's why Game and Thro- Game of Thrones did well, is because people died suddenly, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> constantly. So main yeah. major characters that you thought they'd be there for a, for a while, just like suddenly, no, their heads get chopped off. Sorry, yes. they're gone. You know. Um, so, and I think people appreciate an audience appreciates that because they when they believe that things actually will happen and yes. like really serious things will happen, I think they're more, more keen to embrace the, 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 the narrative arc, you know, um, but look, so let's, do you think we need to bring back epic movies, more epic movies? Oh, like totally. That's the oh, look, I, 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 I was, I'm a big advocate. I was a big advocate for when Netflix first started coming, I actually designed, I created a, what was going to be a uh, six part something three. Yeah. Six parts. Six part mini mini series, but it was like, it was a six hour movie split into one hour pieces. That's all it was. Yeah, which is great. Um, they didn't they didn't respond to the to the material, but um, but that's the sort of storytelling that I thought. Well, this is great, you know. But even yeah. then, and this is a couple of years ago now, and, and you're absolutely right. The golden age has passed because I was led to believe at that time when this is when Netflix was first becoming a major thing. That, oh, you know, you can do whatever you like in Netflix. You can do a six-hour movie. You can do, you know. But it soon became evident that that's not the case, and much more so now, which is th- their model now is is like network TV series. You know, that's their mm-hmm. ultimate model because they know that that works, and mm-hmm. that's the sort of thing they want to kind of uh, kind of support, you know. And even the features, I think they're making less actual feature-length projects because... It's that, as you say, it's that binge watching that once they've hooked you in, you're going to keep coming back for, for more stuff. In a movie, they've got to work that extra bit harder to sell it, to promote it, and if people and and you know they put as much effort into promoting a movie as they do a series, then obviously they get a lot more bang for their buck. Yes, from the series. I think they're reserving that for the sort of Scorsese's of the world. You know those exactly. Yeah, which is a which is really mar- It's a marketing ploy, isn't it, to get them more. Mm-hmm. To get them the Oscar accolades and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, to for people to then go, oh, Netflix is still maybe I should subscribe to Netflix. They're doing prestigious stuff as well, you know. 
Um, uh, I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if um, a Netflix or one of the, you know, basically, and I'm sure they've already done it, but if they appro- they'll approach Tarantino and offer him the world, just say, look, whatever you want to do. For sure, um, yeah. You know. Yeah. I wish they'd approach me and offer me the world. That'd yeah. Be, yeah. That'd be nice. Um, your thoughts on, oh, no, I'm not going to answer that one. We've, had, we've gone through that before. Uh, I think we've done most of the questions. Oh, this is a funny one. Go to Portugal. They have intermissions even for ninety-minute movies, which is a uh, great, that's fantastic. Good. Why? Why? I don't know, but that's oh, it's probably a cuisine. Yeah, so something about you know. The, have a little you know, bit of food, some, or have a nice yeah. another glass of wine, or a beer. Yeah, now I that's like that. that's my idea of, of uh, cinema. I love cinema going. You know, I really did. I mean, the old Progress Theatre in Melbourne was where I saw most of my films in my youth, and you know, they were usually a lot of them were war films that had intermission but i i i you know i i i do uh i loved uh like i remember once upon a time in america was uh was one of those great that was a four-hour film wasn't it once upon a time in america yeah. sergio yeah, leone's yeah, film. yeah. i think i've got an even longer version i think i've got a director's cut that's even more than four hours wow yeah um so I just have to answer one other question by Bad Mojo, who's someone who's asked me many questions, I think, on these things. Didn't Cohen's do Fargo series? Bad Mojo, yes, says Alpha Girl. Um, I don't know that they did, though. I, th- I know it's based on their movie, but I'm I not, think, sh- yeah. I'm not so sure that they were involved. Yeah, yeah. So they, that's just so they didn't have the, they didn't have the pain of sustaining that story for endless no. seasons. Um, Anyway, Clayton, look, thank you so much. I think this has been the longest live stream that I've done, and I think it's been by far the best live stream I've ever done. Oh, so well, there you go. I have you. you. I have you to thank for that. So thank yeah, you thank so you, much. Mate. It was great fun talking to you. It's been great you. chatting. And uh, anytime, if, you, if they let you out of your state soon, please come over and, and visit, and uh, I'd love to have a coffee with you or something. I would love to come over and uh, talk, uh, talk through your workflow and... and uh, and share some notes because yeah, um, come and check it out. Because what, what we're doing is pretty, it's pretty crazy. We've got all the strands, all lots of people coming in, throwing all their knowledge into a, a vat. So out of out of that, I hope we can come up with the the secret sauce, you know, of yeah, of great. a of a virtual production studio, you know. So yeah, great. So I'd I'm, love I'm to have your to input. do the same thing here in Melbourne yeah. and. Uh, and so, yeah, we should uh, definitely get in the huddle. That'll be great. Absolutely. Fantastic, mate. Okay. Well, terrific talking. Cheers. Thank you so much. And thank you right. to everyone who's been watching. Good stuff. Bye.